Welcome back to the SciLife Lab talk show. My name is Lisa Kirsebom. I'm a science journalist, and I'm the one guiding you through these four programs on some of the amazing and varied work that SciLife Lab is contributing to. We air every Friday afternoon at the same time, so make sure to mark your calendar also for the two upcoming shows focusing on data-driven life science and on community collaborations. Today's theme is COVID-19 and how SciLife Lab has taken action against the pandemic. For those of you who want to go a little bit deeper into this topic, after this show, go to YouTube and find the SciLife Lab production Combating COVID-19, a webinar from October 23rd, and you can learn much more. I have with me, to begin with, someone who has played quite an important role in making SciLife Lab's COVID work possible. A warm welcome to Peter Wallenberg, Jr., Chairman of the Board of the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation. Hello, Peter. Hi. On the morning of March 11, you took part in an information meeting on the pandemic, including, among others, Siv Andersson, the co-director of SciLife Lab. After what I've heard, there was a definite before and after this meeting for you personally. Tell me about that. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the board of directors of the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundations, we try to be on top of a lot of questions that are happening around us. And we had all heard and read uh, a lot about the COVID-19, but uh, did we really know what it was all about? No, we didn't. But she was uh, <laughs> very clear in her description of uh, what, what we were talking about and what the pandem pandemic was all about. So uh, I think the whole of the board of directors were extremely concerned uh, after her presentation. And uh, the board of directors also wanted to see to it that we were uh, able to take quick decisions if things happened and changed when it came to the pandemic in Sweden which at the time was not, uh, uh, you know, there was not a lot of, of cases in Sweden at the time, but we realized that this is an international pandemic. So what action did you decide to take in that meeting? Uh, directly in the meeting, it was just to see to it that uh, uh, me and Joran Sandberg, who's the head of the foundation, were uh, allowed to take uh, uh, decisions uh, more rapidly uh, that we had the mandate from the board uh, to to uh, keep on having a, a dialogue and discussion with the research community at SciLife Lab. Um, and uh, already at uh, uh, the end of March, uh, we gave our first grant to SciLife Lab to see to it that uh, we could build new testing laboratories in, in Sweden. And uh, with the help of... of uh, uh, the network within SciLife Lab through Lars Engstrand, Matthias Ulen and Siv, we were able to find uh, testing equipment in China. And so uh, we gave 50 million to see to it that it will be able to, to bring that to Sweden. Uh, and already on the 1st of April, uh, a flight, an SAS flight uh, arrived at Arlanda uh, with all the testing equipment. And only a couple of days later, that was put together at SciLife Lab. Um, since then, I mean, uh, uh, we've seen to it that uh, uh, we've been able to give uh, further grants to see to it that, uh, 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 what is it, uh, 60, 67 research projects have been able to start around COVID uh, in uh, nine, 10 different areas. Um, we added on another 50 million in October to see to it that uh, the research can continue. Uh, and uh, which means that so far we've given 180 million to SciLife Lab uh, in, in, in and around COVID-19. Uh, but that is just to take care of, of the question, what's happening now uh, and what can we do now? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we also started a more long-term project. It's 10, 12 uh, years long, uh, where we give 3.1 billion to data-driven life science. And, and I know that you will have a program around that too. Uh, I think that's extremely important to see to it that we now use uh, the, the new technology in that sense to see to it that we can take care of all the research data that we are uh, finding and see to it that uh, we can use it and be better prepared for <clears throat> pandemics in the future. 
Absolutely. And you're quite right. We will focus on that in next week's show totally. And there is a lot of interesting things to say about data-driven life science. Uh, but when it came to this, the quick pandemic um, investments that you made, how come you decided to channel them through SciLife Lab? I mean, SciLife Lab is uh, uh, the national hub for life science. And uh, the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation, together uh, with uh, the government of Sweden, has been the largest contributors to SciLife Lab. And the network of researchers that we have both in Sweden and internationally through SciLife Lab makes it, you know, the natural uh, uh, part to, to uh, work with. Uh, and one has to underline that, I mean, the quality of the research being done at SciLife Lab is, is extremely good. So you have a lot of th things, uh, positive things around you. Yeah. How has your own life been affected by the pandemic? Like everyone else, um, I'm not allowed to be in my office uh, every day. Um, yeah, I wish I could, but uh, I'm in my office maybe one, two days a week. Um, but I, I think it's it's not, I mean, for us, we can use modern technology like this. But I think what has changed and, and what we really should open our eyes to is is everybody that had to work directly in, in the effects of COVID-19 and, and what uh, all, everybody working uh, within the uh, health uh, healthcare system in Sweden, what they have gone through uh, and what they have to go through uh, and the efforts that they have put into this. So the, the changes that we have made are, are small compared to what everybody else has been able to or have had to do. Mm. This However, very substantial investment from the foundation in COVID-19 research and testing. Um, what difference do you hope this will make in the long run? I hope that uh, it gives us the opportunity to learn and be better prepared than we were at this time. Uh, as you know, there has uh, for a long time been talk about pandemics. Uh, but how prepared were we when it struck? Uh, not very. So hopefully uh, we have been able to contribute in, in some way to see to it that we can be better prepared in the future. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, would you please stay with us for a little while for our next guest? We'd appreciate it. Absolutely. We are about to, before we meet the next guest, take a look at just some of the work to map and combat the virus SARS-CoV-2. <laughs>
we are about to meet another SciLife lab researcher deeply involved in organizing testing of SARS-CoV-2 infected people. Per Sikora at the University of Gothenburg. So my name is Teres Kora. Uh, my work started in March and it all started when we saw an increasing number of infections within Sweden. And we realized very quickly that this will get extremely big and it's going to be extremely complicated to keep track of all the patients, keep track of all the samples and all the answers. So me and uh, Professor K.I., we first of all decided that we need to have a uh, uh, increase the testing capability in Sweden. So we uh, set up a lab in Stockholm called NPC, uh, where we now do about a third of all the testing in Sweden. Uh, it receives samples from uh, VGR, it receives samples from Stockholm, as well as Estebotten. Uh, as a side note to that, we also realized in, in VGR that we need to organize the testing effort. The way we set up testing in VGR was that we used existing infrastructures as much as possible. So instead of establishing separate testing stations, for example, we used our primary care facilities we uh, and health centers. We uh, uh, focused on getting answers as quickly as possible back to the public. So we early uh, took the decision that it shouldn't take more than 48 hours. In When you are in that situation, it's more or less like you are at war because you you have to quickly find any resources that you might use, put that together, uh, cement it together and get it to work. This pandemic, I think, has only displayed how important it is that we uh, uh, do more research into virology and, and uh, microbiology. And then we also have a preparedness for if this would ever happen again. I mean, we were overdue for a pandemic as it was, and we can't we can't relax now. We need to be prepared for this to happen again. We really need to work together both within healthcare and with, between healthcare and research to create an environment that we, where we can quickly address and where we can quickly implement new methods to, um, to address the next pandemic. We already see that, that data science and, and uh, metadata especially around what we're doing is incredibly important and it's going to be more and more important the further along we go. Um, one of the foci of GMS, Genomics Medicine Sweden, is to implement data-driven precision medicine in healthcare. So uh, what we need to do is that we need to organize data in a fashion that we can use it for AI, for example, and that we can use it for meta-analysis, stuff like that. And, and once you try to do that, it becomes very clear that it's not only the sequence data or the like variant data or something that's important. It's also important to link that data into metadata around the patient, like age, sex, um, as well as uh, early diagnosis, link that to imaging data, for example. So you want to combine genomic data with imaging data. All of this is extremely important and all of this is going to, this is going to change the way we do diagnostics in Sweden today. It's very important to be part of Silef Lab, and I think it's important that Silef Lab also is part of the nation. So it's important that we have regional nodes. It's important that we reach out to universities and hospitals, and that we work with different hospitals and universities on their ground. So, Peter Wallenberg Jr. is still with us, but I now welcome also one of the many researchers involved in these COVID-19 combating efforts. Welcome Charlotte Tolin, who combines her research with working as a physician at Dandedud's hospital. Now Charlotte, I know that virus research really isn't your field. Um, would you tell us briefly what you normally do uh, as a researcher and as a doctor? Uh, yes, normally I, my research group looks at the immune system, but in cancer. Uh, so we conduct two large clinical trials at our hospital, including cancer patients or patients with a higher risk of cancer. And in parallel with that, I work as a clinician in our uh, IMU unit, which is a, a, a ward with a higher level of care. 
and we focus a lot of, on, on breathing help for, for patients. So, um, so not quite the ICU, but a little below ICU, but yeah. a little above normal ward. I see you, yes. Hmm? So, so what happened was that we, uh, when the pandemic came, we had to, to pause our cancer studies. And we found ourselves in, in, um, uh, with a steady increasing flow of, of COVID patients. And my uh, PhD student said to me uh, sometime in March that perhaps we should focus on COVID research. And I said to him that he was crazy because the whole hospital was in, in chaos. Uh, we worked day and night with these patients and, and uh, I honestly thought he was crazy. But then I, I started thinking and I realized that we had this uh, unique opportunity that we had uh, passed our study. So we had a large lab within the hospital. We had personnel in the lab that didn't have anything to do. We had apparatus, lab apparatus. We had the possibility to, to, to sample and include patients. At the same time, as we were in the middle of this very interesting cohort of, of COVID patients and also of, of uh, hospital care workers who are healthy but are highly exposed to the virus. And um, that are probably also pretty representative for the population at large, right? If you look at the staff, I mean. Yes, yes. Um, so you started a new clinical study and very fast. Will you tell us a bit about that? Uh, yes, it, it was a crazy period. Um, as I said, it only took a day to understand that my PhD student was right and that we had a, a unique opportunity. So we started drafting a research plan within a day or two and ethical application, uh, applied for ethical permits and got, uh, got it approved within a week, which is uh, highly, highly unusual. And then we applied for funding uh, and got funding through SciLife Lab and Knut and Alice uh, Wallenberg very quickly, which is also uh, highly unusual, this, this rapid response. So these two milestones enabled us to start this study within a matter of weeks, um, which is very, very <laughs> unusual. Could you do it with, your, with the lab that you already had, same equipment, same staff, or did you need anything else? We had the lab, so we had the, the, the rooms. We had some personnel, but this study is, is, is very big compared to what we usually do. So we had to hire additional personnel. And, and luckily, I was able to, to contact people that I had worked with before and who had also worked together with each other. So we built a dream team, I would say, in the lab. Uh, and it was a matter of, of not saying, can you start on Monday? It was a matter of saying, can, saying, can you start tomorrow? And, and they all said yes. Uh, we have one employee who had moved to Spain uh, early in retirement, and she obviously couldn't be in Spain. So she wanted to help, so she came back. And... It was amazing how everyone really wanted to help and contribute. Hmm. Uh, we had to also change the lab to a, a BSL-2 security because we hadn't worked with infectious samples before. So hmm. we had to buy two new uh, hoods to work in. Usually that takes uh, months to get. But this time we got them within a week uh, installed with wow. technique. Techn techn yeah. What was this time like for you personally? Uh, me personally, it was special in the way that uh, usually when you start a clinical study, you need to have a lot of time to plan. You try to put your other work, the clinical work aside, and you can focus on research. Uh, and during this period, I had to work clinically because I work in the IMU and we all had to obviously uh, contribute. Um, so I had to work full time as a clinician at the same time as I worked full time as a researcher. But because I'm in the IMU, I could put my, my clinical shifts in the evenings and on the weekends, and I could focus on my research daytime. And at the same time, I sent my whole family in isolation in our country house. So they were gone for five weeks, <laughs> which was sad, but it was good for the project because I could focus 100%. And I think I, I and, and many with me worked literally 24 seven, but having the research gave me strength to be able to work with the patients because we had nothing to give these patients in the beginning. We couldn't help them. And that was extremely frustrating for us. Uh, and 
having the study daytime gave me and my, my colleagues hope that we could contribute to, to better treatment, to, to better, uh, a better future for these patients. So I think all in all, it was a lot of work, but it was also, it contributed to positive thinking and strength to be able to work with the patients. Yeah. So tell us about the study itself uh, briefly. I know you had a lot of interesting results, but give us some examples. I know what you did was that you collected blood samples to study primarily what happened, uh, the immune response to the virus, right? So what have you figured out so far? Well, the, the immune system, uh, immunity obviously is key in combating this uh, pandemic and, and returning to a normal life. And immunity after um, mild COVID is, is uh, we didn't know anything about the immunity after COVID-19. We still don't know much. And I think the immunity after mild COVID and even COVID without symptoms is extremely important because this is the kind, the part of our society which will go, go back to work. So we have, we collected samples from 2000 plus individuals in, in April, May, and key was to collect early samples early in the pandemic. And that's why it was so good that we could start within a matter of a week to just get the blood samples. And also a lot of, of course, information on the study participants in, in how much they had been exposed, what were their symptoms, pre-existing conditions and so forth. And what we saw in what we call phase one in, in uh, May, June, was that among the hospital care workers, 2000 plus individuals, a large portion had been infected with COVID-19. 20% of our employees in the hospital had antibodies uh, end April, meaning they had had the infection sometime early April, March. And that was extremely worrying because, um, and especially now, because now we see that these individuals, a lot of them have long-term symptoms. And we could also, by comparing our study to other countries who have performed similar studies, we could pinpoint prevention measures not taken in our hospitals in Sweden that actually we can do now that would go into a second phase to prevent our hospital workers from, from getting infected. Because we could see that a large portion of employees working in non-COVID patients had been infected. Uh, so <laughs> we didn't have any, we had no protection equipment working in non-COVID wards. We did no screening of COVID patients of patients unless they had typical COVID symptoms. So obviously a lot of patients in non-COVID wards had COVID. Mm. And now these things have changed partly thanks to the study. Yes, yes. yes. We're, we're trying to change these things, of course, now going forward so that we will yeah, not have a, such a high infection rate among hospital workers. Mm. Tell something about what you are about to study in this study. How do you move on? Yes, the, the positive, the upside, the positive results we have is that we see now in phase two, which is September, uh, August, September, that the majority of individuals, despite having mild symptoms or no symptoms at all, seem to have a long, a long lasting immunity. The majority of, of the participants have detectable antibodies after four to five months. Uh, which is very good news. Uh, and uh, we'll now continue to study. We follow these individuals every four months and we will look at the, the B cells make the antibodies. We will now look at the T cells, the other part of the immune system. And uh, there are some interesting subgroups within this uh, study group. We have individuals that we call long haulers that have long-term symptoms. Like I said, a large portion of the hospital workers that have been infected still have symptoms. They are very interesting uh, uh, from a research perspective. Why do some people have long-term symptoms? And we also have a large portion of individuals, uh, including myself, that have been largely exposed to the virus. I have worked with COVID, like I said, 24 seven in, in, in the spring. And my whole family has been infected, but I don't have any antibodies. I've had no symptoms. I have not been infected. Why do some individuals seem to be resistant? Do they have a pre-existing immunity or is there something else that makes them not contracted in the virus? So there are many things that we need to look at. And this group really comprises an excellent study group because we can follow them over time. And we have early samples and we have individuals with, uh, who have been infected who have had no symptoms, mild symptoms and very severe, severe symptoms. Some have ended up in the ICU. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Peter, listening to Charlotte telling about her work, what are your thoughts? Uh, it's impressive, <laughs> I have to say. Uh, no, but I, I, I think it is, she symbolizes, uh, you know, everything that happened around COVID. Uh, uh, going from nothing, looking at the problem, finding ways of how can we learn more about this? Uh, and, and what you have done is, of course, extremely impressive. Uh, and and uh, we learned a lot from that. So the only thing I can say is that I, I'm, I'm glad that you were part of, of uh, the project that got help in this. And there are many like yourselves uh, that, than yourself. Um, so I'm impressed. It's, uh, and it's extremely interesting to, to follow up on uh, what can we use this for now going forward. Charlotte, these are some really unusual times and they make some really unusual things happen. Um, what would you say was the most unique thing about the study that you've conducted so far? Uh, there are several very unique things uh, in the situation. I think that the, it started so rapidly thanks to, to early funding, um, but also the, the engagement from the study participants uh, has been very impressive. We have uh, usually you lose individuals in every phase. They don't come back. In this case, over 90% came back in phase two, and I'm confident they will come back on every follow up because they are in. The, we have a unique study in that the study participants are in the hospital. They work where we take the samples, so it's very easy for them to come by. But they are also very committed, and they we send them questionnaires through an app system. They answer straight away. They book their time straight away. They are a, a very, very um, uh, extremely good uh, and engaged uh, study population. But also, I would say the, the important uh, collaborations that we have made within the SciLife Lab community, uh, we don't uh, process these samples ourselves. We share them with other researchers within the SciLife uh, community. And um, there are so many good researchers contributing to this study, both within the SciLife Lab community, but also internationally, because they are important samples. Uh, so we send samples every, every few weeks. We send samples to the Netherlands. We send samples to the United States. And having this network of collaborators and having built those collaborations within a matter of months, I think, is very unique um, and, and extremely fun to work with. Certainly. Um, thank you very much. This will be so exciting to follow in the future. So I thank so, you so much for being here to tell us about this, Halot. And thanks also to Peter for joining us today. Now, I've been joined by Phil Ewells, who works at the National Genomics Infrastructure, which is part of SciLife Lab Genomics. Welcome, Phil. Hi. Um, tell me, to begin with, what is your sort of normal work? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I work at the National Genomics Infrastructure, as you say, and I work with bioinformatics development. So we try to come up with new analysis methods and new infrastructure to help the genomics infrastructure uh, generate genomics data for Swedish researchers. Mm -hmm. And what happened to you when the pandemic hit? Yeah, so when the pandemic hit, um, I... I got into an interesting conversation with, with Johan Rung at the data center at SciLife Lab. And the European Commission had um, asked for the EBI, the European Bioinformatics Infrastructure in the UK, to create a data portal for COVID-19 data to try and help with data sharing and research within the academic community. Um, and they also wanted national portals for each of the member states. Uh, the Swedish government asked VR to handle this, who then gave it to SciLife Lab. And, uh, and Johan Rung at the data center headed up the project and, and basically wanted to assemble a kind of a dream team to try and put together this website a, as fast as possible. So he asked me some, for some advice and I ended up basically dropping everything I was doing and helping out on this project to get it up and running as quickly as possible. And it did go pretty fast, didn't it? Yeah, it's one of the fastest projects I've ever worked on, I think. Uh, from that first conversation, I think we had the website live in about two weeks. Uh, which is pretty incredible. It really is. And uh, and nobody else was really all that efficient in the other European countries, right? No, I think the next portal after us took about another four weeks or so. Uh, there's still, there's a handful live now, but, but most countries are still working on theirs at the moment. Yeah. 
Um, so, but now you're not working with the portal, are you? No. So once the portal was kind of up and running, uh, my my involvement slowly tailed off. Now, SciLife Lab and VR have have given dedicated funding to a data center to to do future development and maintenance, and so the project kind of lives on very much. And, it, and is growing, but I'm back at my, my day job at the genomics infrastructure now. <laughs> right. However, I'm sure you're the right person to tell us, what, how is the portal used, actually? Yeah, so the idea of the, the, the portal is to basically kind of bring together uh, both data related to COVID-19 uh, with a, a Swedish focus, but, and, but really less than the results, kind of more focusing on the data accessibility and availability to try and foster reuse of that data. Um, it's also got a lot of information for Swedish researchers, so where you can go to find help, how best to deposit your data, what infrastructures across all of life sciences are, are available. And then other kind of features are being, are being added to the portal all the time. Um, more recently, there's been uh, research highlights that you'll see on the homepage, um, and uh, there's test results from the, the, um, from the Vallenberg and Xilife Lab test centers, um, which are also viewable on the homepage. We're quite keen to add more test statistics so um, we can try and aggregate as much as possible in one place. And something that's really exciting that's being now worked on is um, the Swedish Biobank is going to start a collection of COVID-19 samples for research, and that will, will be uh, uh, viewable and accessible through the COVID-19 Swedish data portal. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's, it's a place to sort of put your data to share your data, but also to be guided on to get help or know where, where you're going to go as a researcher to get help in certain issues? Yeah, exactly. The data itself should be um, deposited in existing repositories according to the data type. But because this is covering all of the life sciences, there's lots of different places and different recommendations according to, to what you're working with. So it's, one, it's basically a one-stop shop for anything to do with COVID-19 research both for researchers uh, wanting to use accessible data, people generating data, and anyone else who's interested in, in kind mm. of the Swedish research around COVID-19. Is it also technically connected to the other portals in Europe or in other places of the world by that? So they all form part of a, a European kind of federated network. We, we all connect to one another. Um, and in certain places, we, we redirect to the, the central European portal um, and vice versa. Um, there has been talk about doing more kind of um, automated and federated data submissions and handling, uh, but that's still kind of in a development stage at the moment. Right. Okay. Um, is there anything in particular that you know that you think should be highlighted as to what the portal has been able to contribute to so far? Yeah, I mean, it's been a really fun project for me to work on, and I think it's, uh, it's been a really good kind of example of what SciLife Lab excels in, in a nutshell. This is a project which covers all of the life sciences in Sweden. Uh, and we were able to pick it up and develop something which everyone basically has been extremely happy with in a record time. Uh, and I can't think of really very many places which would be able to really come together and pull together in such an incredible way. Um, so it's something which is quite remarkable, both in terms of the times we're in with the pandemic, but also shows how well placed SciLife Lab was for this, this kind of assignment. Right. And actually, the rest of Europe is sort of looking to you to know how to develop these types of portals, right? Yeah, absolutely. So the EBI who, who makes the, the main European portal were, were extremely happy with how our collaboration worked. And, and when other countries have been going to them about creating their, their national portals, the EBI has been pointing them towards our portal for reference. Um, all, all of the code we do generally, and including this website, is, is open source and available on GitHub, so we actively encourage other countries to use what we've done and build on what we've done, uh, mm -hmm. and that's starting to really happen now. So it's, yeah. it's really nice to see. It's it's a kind of collaborative and open way that we like to work generally. Very cool. Did you feel that you learned anything personally from this this work with the portal? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I learn something every time I, I take on a new project, and this was no exception. Uh, I had a, I'd like to point out as well, it wasn't just me that, that did this. I, I worked on the kind of the, the web pages, but there were others, specifically Per Kralis and, and Linus Espe at the data center who worked on making the back end of the website work. 
Um, so I, I had some good kind of techie conversations with those guys and learned a bit more about, about how to, to host high volume websites. It was good. <laughs> That's nice. Excellent. Well, um, we were very happy that you could be here with us today and tell us about the portal. So thank you so much, Phil. No problem. Thank you for inviting me. It's been great. We are about to wrap up today's show with once again meeting Per Sikora, uh, but also Vilma Kahnfjorden and Cecilia Persson. Let's go to SciLife Lab in Gothenburg. The best thing about working in clinical genomics is that you really get to help people in real life. Be part of development in biological data. Clinical genomics is working very closely with healthcare and healthcare providers to translate knowledge and research into clinical routine. By extension, we're helping cancer patients, rare disease patients, and patients with infections and um, diseases. And the most fascinating thing here is, that I think, is the data lake we're working with, which is the storage of data. We put everything in a, in, in a data lake. You have the opportunity to create something from all the data that we're collecting. So the way that we are building our data lake, the way we are organizing our data, will provide us with opportunities to create something else from all that data. And that's what we're working on. very hard to do, and very hard to create the kind of environment where we can use data that we've collected over the years to create something new, get new insights. I think the pandemic has demonstrated that we need to put a lot of research into fields that traditionally haven't been prioritized in, especially in healthcare. We need to have a much higher engagement in microbiology, virology, epidemiology, as well as improving uh, collaboration between healthcare and research. Because in a situation like a pandemic, there are new solutions coming every day, and we need to be able to quickly move that into healthcare. It's the best thing uh, about being a, a part of the SciLife Lab is, is I like the collaboration between the regions in Sweden, and I like that there's a goal of bringing Sweden together in um, biological research. And I like being a part of it. You get to be part of a, of a very engaged community uh, that is focused both on research and on implementation in healthcare. And I think it's 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 great to see. I hope Silex sticks around for many more years. You actually get to apply uh, one technique to such a large uh, variety of applications and different samples, and you meet users from industry and universities and different applications and it's very interesting to get a description of the problem they have and then try to find the method within our science that can help them answer the questions. So SynCinemar is the technique you can use to study molecules at atomic level. You can use it for a wide variety of, of samples and one of the key things if you think about how it can really impact um, diagnosis or, or medicine or diseases is really trying to understand what causes a disease at atomic level and understanding this can in the longer perspective uh, help develop drugs it can help develop di diagnosis for certain kinds of uh, diseases cancer diseases or diabetes i would say that the very favorite thing to do with my work is that you can make a difference in other people's research projects if anything from phd students to postdocs that come here with their specific questions then they know everything about their projects but then we can find a little niche where nmr can can take it to another level for that part it is also good to be a SciLife Lab facility and to see the possibilities of developing the network within Sweden for infrastructures. You are part of a network where it stands for quality. The proudness of this work is when you actually make use of the very high-tech equipment we have in the, all the small projects. I believe there is still a lot to be made when connecting different uh, techniques within research projects in Sweden. And I believe that there is always a lack of time from individual groups to make this happen. And I think this is where Silent Lab can really make a difference.
for different research groups. This was the second episode of the SciLife Lab talk show. We continue our conversations next week, same time, when we will talk about data-driven life science, changing the field and the possibilities in quite an overwhelming way. Welcome back. Mm -hmm.